Hello, welcome to How to Write a Novel. Uh, today I just mostly, I guess, would like to reiterate concepts that I have blabbed about many, many times, but uh, just with the idea of workflow. So uh, for the last couple of days I haven't gotten much done. Like I said, two days ago, it's because I got all distracted by uh, this little audio book thing that I was working on. Yesterday it was like, it was a little squirrely of, uh, like I've, I've just got this old phone that doesn't have a data plan and stuff, and uh, that's one of those things like I do think is very helpful, but it's very hard to recommend to someone. Like it's so hard to simplify, you know, to uh, decomplicate your life. For me, it's easy not to have a fancy new smartphone with a cool data plan because I've never had one. Same reason I don't have a credit card, like I just can't. <laughs> I work as infrequently as possible. I try to live as cheap as I can just so I can work less. And without that stability of life and stable income, I just, you know, have no credit history. Uh, I ended up, my first cell phone was just a prepaid phone. And it turns out I way prefer it because, yeah, you can get a little 7-Eleven burner with uh, unlimited texting for $10 a month. It's crazy. It's basically free. If I had a fancy pants smartphone, I'm sure it would be tough to, uh, you know, to get rid of that. You just get used to it. You get accustomed. You get acclimated. And it feels like you're missing out on stuff, even if the reality is that you're not very much. <laughs> like... Like, I know if I had a phone with a data plan that every time I sat down somewhere, every time I pulled out this phone, like oh, I'm gonna do some writing while I'm on the train or I'm gonna stop at this coffee shop I met, I know that I would start every little session in the day checking email, Twitter, and Facebook because that's what I do when I get home, when I've got the internet again and I'm at my normal computer. That's what I always do. And then I just check it kind of compulsively when there's just, you know, I got a little lull. It's like, well, I guess I'll just go check again, even though there's fucking nothing there, you know? Once a day is plenty for that stuff. Once a week would probably be plenty. There's just not that much going on. It's the illusion of activity, the illusion of communication, but the reality is that, uh, I don't know, it's weird. Isn't it weird when you're not around the internet for a couple of days? You feel like you've been on an epic journey. Like, holy shit, I haven't been online for three days. It's gonna be crazy when I fucking check all my shit. And then you check all your shit and there's nothing, nothing fucking happened. Nothing important happened. No one cares that you were gone. You weren't on an epic trip. No one gives a shit. And it's like a little bit of a sobering moment. What do they call that? Uh, the moment of clarity? And you're like, wait a minute, this is all garbage. This is all bullshit anyway. But it's real hard to uh, remember that, you know? It's the same as, like, the little casino thing I went to last week. I looked up, actually, I looked up a thing about slot machines afterward because I'm like, you know, it seems like if you were careful, it's not that tough to win incremental amounts of money on a slot machine as long as you bet low and you're just patient but your hourly rate will probably be like five or 10 bucks an hour. Like it's just not worth the time. And you're not gonna bail out when you're five or 10 bucks ahead because why would you bother? Why'd you even go there? Why'd you show up? You just wanna keep going. And it's like, it seemed pretty clear that the real benefit, what you're paying for is just to be there, just to be in the environment, just to soak it up. And this article I read totally said that exact thing of like, the modern method of slot machine design is just that uh, people want to be bled more slowly. <laughs> you know, they just want to spend time in that environment, and uh, that's really what you're paying for. And uh, I mean, it's just, it seems very similar with just social media that little buzz, that little ding of like, oh, let me check my Twitter messages. Oh, I got a little at reply thing. Somebody favorited a thing, someone retweeted a thing. I got a little Facebook notification, whoa, cool. Email, maybe not so much, because email has way more of a connotation of now I gotta do something. <laughs> I'm like being requested to do some work. But that little, uh, it's surprising how minor it is, just that little feeling, that little dopamine rush or whatever it is, when you, you know you get the nice little C tone 
of the slot machine. You get the nice little ding, ding, ding. You get the little thumbs up on Facebook. Just all this shit. Like, it's all very minor. But that's all it takes. Like, just that little minor massaging of your ego. That little moment of like, yeah, I feel, that feels cool. That's all it takes to just string you along forever <laughs> for your whole life. To just be low level addicted to it for fucking forever. But yeah, I like uh, just removing stuff like that from, because I just don't think about it when it's not available. When I just can't go check all my dumb social media shit on my phone, it's like, okay, then I just won't. But it is like a little tough to really push as a recommendation because it's uh, the same way that it's like a subtle enslavement. It's also a subtle freedom because it doesn't feel better. It doesn't feel more productive. You don't notice that it's a roadblock that's been removed from your day because you can't notice an absence like that, you know? You only can really notice a bonus or a plus or a positive. So you can see the evidence on the long term of being more productive, having less distractions. You can see the effects over time, but in the moment you don't notice. So it's just one of those things you just got to trust is for the best. And yeah, it's a tough thing to uh, to push because it's not going to, like I guess that's the thing is it's not going to really make a difference. If you're dedicated enough to wanting to write a novel, say, the difference maker is not going to be if you can go check your Twitter and your Instagram each time before you sit down to write or not. That's just a subtle aid or detractor. So similarly to that, even though I don't have the data plan and all the fucking hooked up fancy shit, I do have distractions on my phone. I've got a bunch of ebooks. And sometimes I'll just take movies or TV shows or download whatever YouTube shit I'm interested in currently and just toss that on my phone. So uh, lately it's been like just movies that I've mentioned in this podcast. It got me to think like, oh, I should go watch those again. It's like I mentioned Lost in Translation and I re-downloaded Adventureland because I didn't remember Adventureland very well. It just, in my mind, I just vaguely remembered it as having a good tone, just a good hangout movie. And I'm like halfway through and man, it's holding up really well. What a cool movie. Like it's not extremely plot driven. It's just the tone is just so good. And just here's the scenes. It's just it's the 80s. Here's a bunch of kids that work at this uh, amusement park. And here's all the little vignettes of shit that happens to them. It's really awesome. That director, Greg Matola, his name is, he did super bad after that, which was kind of similar, but way more, you know, comedy driven. But none of his other movies are really like that. The same way Sofia Coppola, I haven't kept up with all her stuff, but really nothing else is like Lost in Translation. And it's one of those weird things where it's like, I guess you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over. I guess. But when you're so good at this one particular type of style, this one kind of tone that is so hard to find, so elusive and so great, you know, like walking that line between, you know, a boring, eventless movie... (laughs) And a cool tone piece, a mood piece, you know, it's very hard to do. It's so easy for a movie to just either be tonally completely boneheaded, which is mostly the case, or to be going for tone, but just to get that art school feeling, aimless, boring pretentiousness, which is also just maybe worse, (laughs) you know? Anyway, I had those and... uh, like, Danny from the Game Grumps just posted a playthrough of Space Quest 2, and I love those old Sierra games, and like, oh, this is great. Threw that on there. And I'll just kind of flip through these things, like, watch a minute of this, watch a minute of that, watch a minute of that. But usually that's just uh, a little distraction. If I get a little gummed up while I'm writing, it's like, okay, let me just take a few minutes to go just watch some little moments from a few little movies and TV shows, and that'll just kind of ungum my brain, get uh, the gears working again. But yesterday, I was just like, just basically watching movies all day, (laughs) like way too much. I got very little done till finally when I was on my way home at the end of the night and it's just like dark as fuck. Everything's closed, but I'm like, man, this is just not, this is not how I want to end this day. So I found a Tim Hortons that was open late 
and went in there for another hour and just sat down and wrote some stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. I got some shit done today. Because I'd been, you know, picking away throughout the day, but so little, just so little got done. It was absurd. And I didn't even get a ton done at that Tim Hortons. It was mostly just kind of uh, to re-dedicate myself to, like, reconfirm, like, this is what we're doing. We're working on this book. This thing is important. And if you just fuck around all day and you don't get anything done, then this is what's going to happen. On the way home, you're going to stop in somewhere else and do something. (laughs) You're going to do something before you go home. So then I started thinking, like, what do I do about this? Is it that I have, are these movies too interesting to me? Should I have more boring movies on my phone? But it's not really about that. Like, I do think it's important to sort of limit your distractions, but there's no point trying to just eliminate the distractions because there's always a distraction. You know, if it wasn't these movies, it would be the ebooks. If it wasn't that, I would listen to a podcast. If it wasn't that, I could just go to a mall and wander around a bookstore or something. Like, there's always ways to to distract yourself. So it's important to have them, I think. It's better to have something on deck and ready if you need to distract your brain a little. Because you're going to do it. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. You shouldn't be overwhelmed by distractions. But there's going to be some. Like, there's a great line in that movie Bronson... Kind of a weird movie, not really my favorite. Really good performance by the lead guy. What's his name? You know, Bane and Mad Max and all that. But there's a part where he's uh, in jail for, I mean, ages, like decades. And uh, the way he describes jail is that it's just pure living day after day. And I love that description of it because, yeah, it's like pure living is actually unpleasant. You gotta have something to get your mind off of just being a person on the earth. Like, that's just too boring. That's too rote sometimes. Like, you need some fantasy time in your fucking life. It was just uh, too in excess yesterday. But, again, that's where I, uh, I think this little plan of really being a bulldog about working every day, but not forcing myself about how much work I do on those days really is working out well for me because yeah I didn't get much done in the last couple of days but maybe that's just how my subconscious needed it to be you know like maybe it's not coincidence maybe these aren't the most fascinating movies of all time maybe something in my head was like we just gotta slow down here we gotta process what's happening in this story a little slower The sump pump of my fucking mind is like, it's going slow today. But yeah, you just kind of got to trust, trust in the overall process. Because today, today I kind of had that in the back of my mind of like, okay, at the very least, let's not start the day by watching little movies and YouTube videos on my phone. Because sometimes I'll do that. I'll just like, okay, let me just sit down, watch this stuff for five or ten minutes just to ease in. Because sometimes it can be a little much to just wake up, leave the house, go get a coffee, just sit down and face down the book. It's kind of like a bucket of water in the face. It's like, whoa, geez, come on, I'm not I'm not ready yet, <laughs> you know? But today I was like, okay, none of that though. Because yesterday I just spent way too long watching dumb movies. So today I went and got the coffee, sat down, got to the writing and man it went so good it was another one of those days where it's just like this nice flood this nice big like boom breakthrough and once again it makes me wonder like even though it seemed like the last two days were like man I'm fucking up I'm not doing a very good job here maybe my subconscious knows more than I do you know like maybe it knew that where I was heading is not quite where I'm supposed to be going and it just hadn't put the pieces together yet because today I'm still in the middle of this big conversation between these characters and conversations like I've said are way more abstract you know like even if you plot out where you want a conversation to go that's just not how conversations work if you just write it out like that it's going to be stiff and awkward and it's not going to feel real and it's not going to feel right so I started writing today and real quickly Man, it was such a great... Speaking of old Sierra games, like in King's Quest 1, 
sometimes this fairy godmother floats down from the sky and just like uses her little magic wand to bestow upon you a spell of protection. That's what I felt like today. I just felt like the little fairy godmother came down and tapped her wand on my head, you know, the muse or whatever. Because this conversation between these characters took kind of a left turn into basically one of them is a scientist and one of them is kind of like a barbarian, sort of. Oh, fucking... I'm on a real obscure path and there's still a guy? Come on, dude. But it went down this path of... Uh, kind of just like, so why are you asking me so much about my, my culture, my planet that blew up? Is this so you can trade it with your science buddies and just talk about us and study us? And he diffuses that worry, but then he's like, so how many science type people do you even know? You know, like, have you run into? And she's like, what, you think my planet was just a bunch of idiots? Like, we're fucking a space-faring species. I mean, of course we have science people. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, I know that. We actually know quite a bit about your people, but we know about the center people, the core people, the science people. Where you're from, you know, he says this all in a much nicer way, but you're from Hicksville. You're from the middle of nowhere. Your ideas, even about your own planet and your own species, may not necessarily line up with what we know of your people, or even how your people would describe yourselves. It's like, maybe you don't know this, but you're on the weird end of a weird species, <laughs> you know? Your species is already weird, and you're from the goddamn boondocks. You're kind of crazy in a different way. You're a fucking redneck. You're a hillbilly, you know? <laughs> and this is kind of like the first little dawning. You know, she's like offended on the one hand of like, what, really? You think you know more about us than I know? Get the fuck out of here, science guy. But also this kind of dawning of like, wow, maybe I really was from an isolated place. Like, like what if my beliefs and the way I was raised, what if they really are weird? What if this guy is onto something? And it was such a cool little conversation and not at all where my notes were planning to go. Or again, it's one of those things that extra feels neat because of this like sci-fi context. I didn't do a lot of world building and I didn't write a culture Bible for these people. I just have a tone. I have a tone in my head that is, that's what's rock solid. I know how this place is supposed to feel. I know how these two characters are supposed to feel. Not even, I know how the one character is supposed to feel in relation to this place. I know how the station feels and I know how she feels as an outsider. That's it. Those are the things that I 100% know. And then all my other notes and all my other ideas and all my ideas for scenes and plans for this story those are all potentially useful, but maybe not applicable. That's all malleable. So it's cool even to come up with some of this stuff. I mean, I guess the idea of her being kind of a weird hillbilly redneck of her species was because I was texting with my friend Brad and we were talking about space cultures and star control and shit. And he was saying how, like with star control, it's the definition of a monoculture. Like if you meet one member of a species, you've met them all, with very rare exceptions. There's like the Vux captain who is a weird space pervert who's different from the others, but that's like the only one. Everyone else is like, if you've met one, you've met them all. And he's saying how like, that is kind of a shame. That's one of the very few downsides to star control is that they just couldn't diversify a little more. And talking to him about that, I was like, you know, rolling that idea around in my head, because I like the idea of the monoculture in this, in the case of this story, because it's about a intolerant, zealotous, you know, bigoted, crazy space alien, <laughs> you know? But I still, and then I thought like, yeah, maybe I can get the best of both worlds. She can still be that way, because that's the sect she's from. I don't need to paint her whole species and her whole planet as all being this way. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, whatever. All that's really important is that her part is. So I kind of get the best of both worlds. But that was like a couple of months ago. We had that conversation. It was just floating around in the back of my head. So now it like came back to me this time. And I'm like, yeah, this is where this fits. This is a good place for this to come up. So I only made it like halfway through the talking points that I intended to get to in this chapter. 
But at this point, this conversation is like going a little deep for her. It's getting a little over her head. She's not appreciating how sciencey this science guy is being of like, you know, of course there are certain physiological imperatives that keep a level of uniformity amongst a species planet wide, but blah, blah, blah. So she's not enjoying that. And just the physical aspect of this conversation is just that she just found a ball somewhere. She's just been bouncing a ball around. And she like throws it at him and sees for the first time his, the full extent of like how far his creepy space alien arm can extend and his little weird tendrils. And she just feels queasy just looking at the guy in general, but seeing this super alien movement just extra kind of turns her stomach. So these things combined, what just seemed natural, what seemed to fit, is that this conversation is over. <laughs> you know, she's like, all right, that's enough. You're starting to take this conversation in areas that I don't particularly care to talk about or think about right now, and you're just fucking grossing me out. Time for you to go. <laughs> Time for you to get out of here. So it's so great. Like, again, this, like, yeah, I stalled out for a couple of days, but then what I came up with today is clearly better, is much more obviously a good way for this conversation to go rather than just hammering through my first draft idea of where this conversation might go. Because all that stuff can still come later, there's no big hurry. So now I've still got half of this, the original notes that I'll just put into the idea pool to come up later. And I think that's a very good sign for this book in general, like this has been happening the whole time. Like I think I mentioned that these two characters in my initial thoughts were going to meet in chapter 3 and they didn't meet till chapter 8. Because the story keeps telescoping out. Which I think is a very good sign, because uh, if it went the other way, if it just was like I'm always trying to fill space and like I'm always grasping for ideas, that would be trouble. That might be a sign that maybe this idea is not robust enough for me to fashion into a whole novel. But I'm really finding the opposite. I mean, this story is a very limited scope. It really is just a space alien girl on a space station not getting along, basically talking to this one other alien. That's most of this story. But within that really limited little framework, all kinds of things keep coming to me and stuff just keeps expanding. And I'm really like excited about it. I think it's going to be so cool <laughs> when it's all done. So that's where, yeah, I just feel like I've hit a good balance as I've said many times, and as I will continue to reiterate, but because, you know, there's, a, there's the idea that you really do need to dedicate yourself. If you're going to write a novel, you need to have some discipline. You do need to work on this thing and work and work and work till it's done. And you don't want to just wait for inspiration to come. If you're just always waiting for inspiration to hit before you write, you'll just never write anything. Like, that's it. You've essentially given up. You've stopped. It's not going to happen. So I really feel like I've hit a good mix of the two, of like, I have the dedication to work on it every day. Like, that's, that's nailed down. Like, that's going to happen. Even if I don't feel it and I don't have an easy time writing and the ideas aren't quite coming, I'm still going to sit down and write every day and keep up the momentum and keep up the, the habit and the ritual if for nothing else, then just to continually reaffirm to myself, to my own subconscious, that yes, this is important. This is what we're doing. This is what we're dedicating our mind space and our resources to, is this story. This isn't going to stop. This is the thing. So learn to love it, because this is what we're doing. But at the same time, if the inspiration isn't there, if I'm kind of forcing it, or if I'm muddling my way through, or if my mind is just constantly derailing me, and it's like, I just, I don't want to write this, I don't want to work on this, I want to watch Lost in Translation, I want to watch Adventureland, I've set up this little daily ritual so that it is malleable in that way, you know, that this membrane is pliant. <laughs> that, that yes, I'm still going to sit there and I'm going to bang my head against the wall if I have to bang my head against the wall. And if, if the way forward isn't clear, that's fine. I might, you know, I'll go crazy slow that day. I will tiptoe forward. I will write a sentence, two sentences, tiny little bits. 
break the chapter into pieces to try to make it more digestible. Take every little beat one at a time, one little moment at a time. So that I've got the rigid, you know, lock and file, like we're marching, we're marching, we're working. Every day we're working on this, but in that day, if the inspiration isn't there, I'm also like allowing for that side of my mind. It's like, okay, I understand that you're not ready yet, that you haven't digested all these thoughts yet, that you haven't found the way forward. So I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to force you. We will just pick away, pick away at a very, very tiny, slow pace. Go back to, I guess it's still my favorite metaphor, but the pickaxe to the rock wall. Just pick at the wall, nothing. Pick at the wall, nothing. Pick at the wall, nothing. But I still swung every day. I still picked at the wall every day. And then when the landslide happens, when the rock slide happens, and there's a bunch of gold in there, it's like, yeah, I wouldn't have got to that if I hadn't have picked away all those other days because I would have just stopped. So it's the combination. It's the combination of discipline and waiting for the muse. Because if you wait for the muse without the rigid daily discipline, the muse ain't going to come. You're just done. You're just not working on it anymore. But if you force yourself without allowing the muse to breathe, without allowing your subconscious and your your full mind to fucking process all of the disparate elements of this extremely abstract concept, this abstract project you're trying to bring forth, then you'll just get rote writing and you'll just get boring shit. It'll be boring to you, it'll be boring to everyone else, and probably you'll also not finish because if it's boring to you, if sitting down and writing is a boring task, how long are you really going to keep that up? Are you going to keep that up for two years? Because if you do, maybe <laughs> maybe you're a fucking real weirdo. How can I better put that? <laughs> I wonder if I go along through this, if I'll get better at not just using blanket insulting terminology. Who can say? Because, I mean, hey, of course you're a weirdo. I'm a weirdo. We're all weirdos. But how? How do we best marshal our weirdo dem? Weirdo dumb. That's what this is all about. All right, so song of the day. I keep trying to think of songs that are applicable to what I talked about on the day, but that's too. That's. My mind is too focused on other things to also keep an index of all the songs that I know and the uh, thematic relationship they might have to abstract concepts. So let's just listen to If Things Work Out by The Hardship Post. Adventureland kind of made me think of this song. It's this pretty obscure Canadian band from the East Coast. This is such a great song. It's this really quiet little song that it's got all this ambient sound of like a TV in the background and people talking and it's so beautiful. I love this song. And I was thinking if I was ever to make a music video for this song, I could probably use clips from Adventureland. Just some of the uh, more spacey sort of chilled out parts between uh, the lead dude and the chick from Twilight. I really like that main character in this. What's that dude's name? But you know, the Facebook guy. The dude from the hit Fox television series, Get Real. It's weird that I can't remember any of these people's names right now, but uh, he's a really good character in Adventureland because he's kind of, you know, he's like a nerdy sort of stiff dude, but not all the way. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie, I Love You, Beth Cooper? I only watched 15 minutes of it, and I'm like, I can't deal with this, because this guy, this main character, this awkward nerd, is such an awkward nerd. It's way too much. It's like, I hate this guy. I don't even want to watch this guy. This is not what I relate to, where Jesse Eisenberg, that's his name, where Jesse Eisenberg's character in Adventureland, he's way more to me of a real nerd, of like, the way I was and the way all my friends were. It's like, yeah, you know, we're into nerdy shit and we know way too much trivia about nonsense and we're into video games and bullshit. 
But man, you know, I mean, we can turn it on. We got some good ones here and there. We got some zingers. We say some clever shit. We do some charming shit once in a while. You can't just be a hopeless nerd character. <laughs> what is the point of that? Who's even like that? Every dog has his fucking day. And I really do like how how they play that character in that movie. Where it's like, yeah, he's not the coolest cat in the world. But in his own way, you know, he plays to his strengths. <laughs> you know? He's like, yeah, I'm not like everybody else. But hey, I can work with this. I can make this work. It's cool. Anyway, so here's If Things Work Out by the Hardship Post. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yes, I lie, he had, but I won't hide, I know you're so beautiful, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it alright, I know you're so beautiful.